my pleasure to welcome you to our Lindau lecture. Uh, those of you who have attended previous HLFs know that uh, as part of the collaboration with the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting, um, we have one presentation each year at HLF by, given by the Nobel Laureate, who normally visits the Lindau meetings. And in exchange, uh, there is one presentation by a Heidelberg Laureate at the Lindau meeting in June. And this year, this was given by Les Valiant. And in return, the Lindau lecture this year will be given by William Phillips from the University of Maryland. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997, together with Stephen Chu and Claude Cohen Tanuji, for his work on cooling and trapping atoms with laser light. And uh, in the spirit of this work, he will talk about some as you can see, some really cool stuff today. Uh, and this will not be without side effects, both <laughs> optical and acoustical. Uh, and for that reason, we have to urge you not to come down uh, the aisles during the presentation. If for any reason you have to leave the room during the presentation, please use the upstairs doors. But this is a hazard zone uh, to a certain degree. <laughs> Uh, so, we're looking forward. Bill, thank you for coming. Thanks and, very uh, much. It's going to be fun. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, I'm, I'm very happy to be here in, uh, in Heidelberg to give the Lindau Lecture. Uh, I was very pleased that the last time that I was uh, in Lindau that Vint Cerf gave the Heidelberg Lecture, and I hope that I can uh, do as good a job giving the Lindau Lecture as Vint did giving the, the Heidelberg Lecture. So this is, uh, I think, the comic relief for uh, uh, the, uh, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. There's uh, going to be almost no mathematics, uh, uh, no computer science, uh, but there may be a little bit of fun. So, uh, time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. So I should say, uh, uh, to begin with, uh, and I'm competing against the sun, I realize here, uh, that in fact, it's true that I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm also from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is the, uh, the uh, American equivalent of the, uh, of the PTB uh, here in Germany. It's our National Metrology Laboratory. Uh, and we're part of the Joint Quantum Institute, which is a joint operation between NIST and the University of Maryland. And I'm part of the Laser Cooling and Trapping Group, and the permanent members, Gretchen Campbell, Paulette, and Trey Porto, are uh, people with whom I have the pleasure of, uh, of working every day. Now, uh, of course, it's important when giving these talks to acknowledge the people who give you the money. Uh, and uh, the Navy has given us money for a long time, and uh, the National Science Foundation uh, supports a physics frontier center. But I also want to say, because I think it's relevant to a number of, of people here, that we have another joint institute, which I'm not part of, but I work uh, closely with them. This is the Joint Institute for Quantum Information and Computer Science. And uh, this is combining ideas from uh, uh, from quantum computing and other kinds of quantum information uh, uh, areas with uh, computer science to really do something interesting and useful. And so some of you people may be uh, uh, interested in, in working with this, uh, this great organization. So let me repeat the warning that I've uh, 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 posted before. Uh, uh, there may be some interesting, thing happen, some interesting things happening. Now, because I'm not sure how long this talk is going to take, so I may uh, run over into the question time. I want to invite everyone, but especially the, uh, the, uh, the young rabbits, to, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to ask me questions, uh, not just after the talk, but just any time you see me. If you ask me a question, I will give you a prize. <laughs> Uh, but more than that, if you want to talk about stuff, then just say, why don't we have lunch together? Why don't we have dinner together? Why don't we sit together on the boat ride, okay? So that's what I'm really looking forward to you. I've been having a wonderful time. Some of you, uh, we've had meals together, and it's been wonderful. And so I want to uh, extend that as much as we can. So, uh, so please ask me questions, uh, and you'll get a prize, as long as the question is not, what's the prize? <laughs> okay, so now, 
time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. Okay, so you might ask, well, what does time have to do with Einstein? Well, time put Einstein on the cover <laughs> of their magazine. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it was a really good choice because Einstein did all sorts of things that uh, really changed our uh, our lives in, in important ways. Uh, and each one of these things that I've noted here would be worth uh, a one hour lecture in itself. Uh, but probably the thing that Einstein is most famous for is his theory of special relativity. That theory really changed our notions of space and time. Before Einstein, people thought that space and time were like an unchanging stage on which the events of the universe played themselves out, like the stage on which I'm standing here. But what Einstein taught us was that the stage was part of the action, uh, that time and space depended upon what was happening and how people were looking at it. And Einstein came to this understanding about the relativity of time by asking himself a question that I suppose people have asked themselves since the beginning of human time. What is time? What is this strange thing that is always in the present but will soon become the past? Uh, how does it turn out that the future becomes the present? Why is tomorrow always one day away? Uh, <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, you know. Uh, uh, and, and to answer this question, Einstein uh, gave an answer which you may find to be a little superficial. He said that time is what a clock measures. But by taking seriously that idea, Einstein came to his understanding about the relativity of time. But if time is what a clock measures, then we can ask ourselves, what is a clock? Well, for me, a clock is something that ticks, something that gives you a periodic set of events. The earliest clock is the rotating Earth. Now, ancient people did not know that the Earth was rotating, but they saw the sun rise and set uh, every day, and in that way, they were able to tick off uh, uh, days. Uh, uh, later, uh, Galileo discovered uh, that, uh, you know, the, the legend is that Galileo was in the cathedral in Pisa, and he was watching the chandelier of the church swing back and forth. And apparently, he wasn't paying so much attention to the worship service. Uh, uh, and, and he was timing the period of the chandelier with his own pulse and found that whether the chandelier was swinging a lot or whether it was only swinging a little, that the time to go back and forth was essentially the same. This discovery of the independence of the period of a pendulum on its amplitude led uh, other people to make uh, clocks, like this beautiful uh, tall clock or grandfather's clock that you see here, uh, using a pendulum as the ticker of the clock. Now some of you, like me, maybe some of the older ones, because I realize that young people don't wear watches anymore, but, um, but, but some of you may be wearing a clock on your wrist. And inside this quartz watch, is a, uh, a tuning fork shaped crystal and the vibrations of that crystal are the ticking for this, uh, this quartz watch. So all of these, uh, all of these clocks uh, have tickers. Some of these clocks are marvelous works of engineering and art. Uh, some of them are just silly, like this uh, Heidelberg uh, cuckoo clock. This isn't even a clock, it's a refrigerator magnet. And, um, uh, and, and yes, it's, it's right twice a day, uh, but that's not particularly useful. But all of these clocks are imperfect in one way or another. So, so the, uh, the swinging of a pendulum is almost independent of how far it swings, but it is not at all independent of how long the pendulum is. And so the pendulum may stretch or shrink, and that's going to change the, uh, the, the period of the pendulum, the ticking rate. Every quartz watch is a little bit different, manufactured a little bit differently. And it may keep a different uh, time depending upon whether you keep it on your wrist or whether you put it uh, on the bedside stand uh, at night. 
even the rotation of the Earth is not constant. It is slowed by the tides. Uh, it's changed by things like earthquakes or changing uh, ocean currents or storms. The fact that the Earth's rotation is so variable was made clear to me in a way that was rather dramatic for me. One day I was visiting the US Naval Observatory. The Navy uh, uh, of all countries has been interested in timekeeping for navigation for centuries and they've always been interested in clocks and still are today and I was visiting a colleague who was going to show me the latest in clocks at the Naval Observatory and as we were walking to his laboratory we passed by a, a door and on the door was written, Director of Earth Rotation. <laughs> it sounds like a rather responsible job. Uh, uh, you wonder, what happens if he goes on vacation? <clears throat> well, anyway, the point is that somebody is keeping track of these variations in the rotation of the Earth. Uh, because uh, people like astronomers want to know where to point their telescopes. Uh, some people are still navigating uh, by the stars, and so this is important to do. Uh, so all of these clocks are, are uh, imperfect in one way or another. Sorry? Of what? Oh, well, the... Uh, yeah, so the question is, what forces of nature cause the vibration of a quartz crystal? And the answer is the same as the answer for almost everything that we observe in our daily lives. It's electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is, is the force that controls almost everything that we experience that isn't gravitational. Of course, gravity keeps us from floating away, but almost everything that has to do with the way we live and, uh, and uh, uh, the way we operate uh, is electromagnetic. Uh, of course, there are two other forces of nature, the weak force and the strong force, and they control things that happen in the nucleus, but we usually don't see those things, even though they do affect us. We don't see their effects. So the vibration of a quartz crystal, it's electromagnetic forces. The way it works is that uh, you have a feedback mechanism in there, and you get the quartz crystal oscillating, and there's a feedback that keeps it, uh, that keeps it oscillating uh, at the natural frequency of the quartz. Okay, so anyway, but it's not perfect because every quartz crystal is a little bit different and temperature and humidity may affect it. Okay, sorry? Where's the gift? Oh, well, later, because look, I, you, so, so come down and, and ask me later about the gift. But the thing is, I've got a lot of material to cover and, uh, and, and I want to make sure that we get to it all because it's all wonderful. So, okay, so, among all of these possibilities of, of different kinds of tickers for clocks, the best tickers are atoms. So why are atoms tickers? Well, uh, as you know, atoms have certain energy levels. And in order to go from one energy level to another, one of the ways you can do that is to shine in, <coughs> excuse me, shine in light or microwaves or radio frequency to induce a transition between the levels. And the frequency of that light has to match the difference in the energy levels. And the great thing about atoms is that every atom of the same kind is absolutely identical to every other atom of the same kind. We define the second to be a certain number of vibrations of cesium-133. As far as we know, every cesium-133 atom in the entire universe is identical to every other cesium-133 atom. So you don't have to worry about uh, the origin of your cesium. If you make a cesium clock in your laboratory and you do a good job, you are going to get exactly the same frequency ticking as everyone else in the world or in the universe who makes such a cesium clock. And that's one of the reasons why uh, these atomic clocks are so good. The other reason is that they are very little affected by the environment, and we protect them from most of the things in the environment, so they really make great clocks. Now, you may ask, how good are these clocks? Well, if you want to buy a retro watch like mine, I mean, this has a calculator on it. Uh, it's hard to imagine something more retro than my watch. Uh, 
you can get this uh, for less than 100 euros. And it is so good that it will only gain or lose about 30 seconds in a year. That's about a part in a million for less than 100 euros. But if you're willing to spend 100,000 euros, you can buy a commercial atomic clock that will keep time to a part in 10 to the 12. Now you may say, 100,000 euros for a clock, that's a lot of money. But think about it this way. You spend 1,000 times more money and you get a million times better performance. <laughs> I think that's a bargain. But you may still ask yourself, why does anybody want a clock that is that good? Because after all, we don't really need to know what time it is to that level of precision uh, in order to go about our daily lives. Or so you may think. In fact, I now want to convince you that you are very happy that somebody is keeping track of what time it is to that level of precision for things that matter very much to you in your daily life. I found this advertisement in a magazine once, uh, an advertisement for some uh, expensive car, and it says, if you get into trouble uh, in our car, don't worry, because help is only 10,000 miles away. So I apologize for the 10,000 miles. You know, the United States is actually one of the original signatories of the 1875 Convention de Maître, the meter treaty, that we agreed at that time that we would keep all of our standards in terms of metric units. And we have done that. There is, there is no legal mile in the United States. It's defined in terms of the meter, okay? And yet we persist in using these foolish units. <laughs> So I, I apologize for that. But the point is, the, 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 the 10,000 miles, the 1,600 kilometers, uh, 16,000 kilometers that they're talking about is the orbiting altitude of the satellites of the global positioning system. So there's a, a, a cartoon of one of those satellites. How does this global positioning system work? Well, here's a, here's a cartoon version of the global positioning system. There are at least 24 satellites, each of which have uh, several atomic clocks on them that are of this quality that you can buy for 100,000 euros. Now, the ones that go into the satellites cost a lot more because, you know, they have to be space qualified. But it's the same idea. These are things that are good to a part in 10 to the 12. And they're all synchronized. So all the satellites are synchronized. And now, just for the sake of argument, let's imagine that you, on the Earth, have a GPS receiver and it has a clock in it. It does not. Maybe in the future it will. But just for the moment, let's imagine that it has a clock. And all the clocks are synchronized. So you see, all the clocks are reading one. Now, let's animate this and see what happens. These clocks, these satellites, are broadcasting what time it is. And that information about what time it is is traveling to the receivers at the speed of light. They're also broadcasting where they are. So let's see what happens. So they broadcast what time it is. And because the speed of light is finite, it takes a certain amount of time for the information about what time it is to get to you. So your clock says that it's four, and all the other clocks say that it's four, but the signal that you got from that clock says it's one. That means you know how far away that clock is from you, and you know where it is. So that means you know you're somewhere along here. So that's great, but there's more. There's more satellites, of course. So when you get the signal from the other satellite, then you know how far away you are from the first satellite, so you're on this curve, and you know how far away you are from this satellite, so you're on this curve, so you know you're here. Now. If we lived in a two-dimensional world and you had a clock, then that would be all we would need. But we live in a three-dimensional world, so you need one more satellite to complete the triangulation. And you don't have a clock, so you need one more satellite. So you need four satellites. So if you turn on your GPS receiver and it says looking for satellites, that's what it's doing. It's trying to find four. If it finds more, so much the better. A little bit of redundancy never hurt. So this allows you to determine where you are 
anywhere on the face of the earth to within a few meters. This is incredible. People use this for all sorts of things. Uh, the, uh, uh, the car that brought me here this morning had a GPS uh, uh, and guided it right well. I'm pretty sure the driver knew how to find his way to University Plus, but, <laughs> but still, I think that we're getting to the point that people won't know how to find their way home from the grocery store if they don't have their GPS on. And it's all because of atomic clocks, and people are using this for all sorts of things. Commercial aircraft, military vehicles, people take them when they're hiking in the mountains so they don't get lost, all kinds of things. The global positioning system is so good that Earth scientists can use it to study continental drifts. If you average for long enough time, you can see changes of centimeters in a year. That's how good the global positioning system is. Now, you might ask, what do these atomic clocks look like? Well, I found another advertisement in a magazine. Uh, it said, uh, this was an advertisement for an airline. It said that the uh, atomic clock in Braunschweig, Germany, that's where the PTB is, the, the German uh, Metrology uh, Institute, uh, uh, that recently uh, they set the atomic back clock back one full second. Our flight schedules have been adjusted accordingly. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, uh, this airline is no longer in business. <laughs> But, but they're right about this adjustment of the second. This is what's called a leap second. So remember I told you that the rotation of the Earth is changing. Whenever the rotation of the Earth gets out of sync with the atomic clocks, which are keeping better time, whenever they get out of sync by uh, a large fraction of a second, then they reset the, uh, uh, the standard time by one second to keep atomic time and sun time the same. Because if you didn't do this, then it would no longer be noon when the sun was highest in Greenwich and people would start to get confused about when to have tea in England. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's a big controversy as to whether we should continue to have uh, leap seconds, but uh, it makes great cocktail conversation because most people don't know about it. Uh, but, but that's really not the point. Uh, by the way, the last time we had a leap second was uh, New Year's Eve of 2016. That day, December 31st, you got one extra second in the day. I hope you all used it wisely. <laughs> but I'm not showing you this in order to tell you about leap seconds. The reason I'm showing this is to assure you that the instrument in front of which these two dorks are standing <laughs> looks nothing like an atomic clock. I mean, isn't this marvelous? Is this big clock face? <laughs> we don't have that. And then there's this 1940s electronics here. <laughs> it's just amazing. If you were to go to our atomic clock laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, uh, a few years ago, you would have seen an instrument that looks like this. Now, inside uh, this long tube is an atomic beam of cesium. And because, remember, cesium is the, is the element whose ticking is what we use to define a second. And here is the oversimplified version of how it works. So you have a cesium atom, and it has two different states. Well, it has lots of different states, but I only care about two. These two states correspond to the nuclear spin and the electron spin pointing in two different relative directions. So if you flip the spin of the electron relative to the nucleus, that corresponds to the two different states that we have here. And the uh, frequency difference between those two is this. That's the definition of what the frequency difference between those two states is that's how we define how long a second is. Now the way the atomic clock works in this oversimplified version is you put the atoms all in this state, you shine in microwaves. If the microwaves have exactly the right frequency, then the state of the atoms changes. And if it doesn't, then the state of the atom stays the same. So you just tune the microwaves until it's changing the state of the atoms and now your microwaves are ticking at just the right frequency. Now that's a grossly oversimplified version. Here's a version that's simply simplified. 
uh, which means wrong, of course, you understand. But the point is that you have this atomic beam. So these uh, atoms are moving along at about 200 meters per second. And over the, the, the region in which uh, you, uh, you have the microwaves, you irradiate these atoms with microwaves. And if uh, the atoms are changing state, then the microwaves are the right frequency. And if they're not, then you have a feedback loop. And that makes the, uh, 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 corrects the frequency of the microwaves until it's making the atoms change state. Now, here's the point. Even these atomic clocks are imperfect. And the main reason they are imperfect is because the atoms are moving so fast. Someone said making an atomic clock is sort of like trying to tell time with a clock that is going past you at the speed of sound and crashing into the wall. It doesn't sound so easy, but, but scientists and engineers have been working on this problem for many decades and have gotten these things so they work better than a part in 10 to the 14. So that's more than 100 times better than what you can buy. If you go into a, a laboratory, you can find atomic clocks that are good to a part in 10 to the 14 or better. Why are they limited to a part in 10 to the 14? Well, because the atoms are going so fast. The, um, you might think of it this way. The atoms only spend uh, about uh, 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 five milliseconds here in the, um, uh, in the apparatus. The apparatus is about a meter long, and it's going at about 200 meters per second, so they spend about five milliseconds. The frequency that the atoms see is the Fourier transform of that pulse of of microwaves, and it turns out to be about 100 hertz wide. This is out of a frequency of about 10 gigahertz. So that means it's uh, a part in, uh, uh, in uh, let's see, 10 gigahertz is, is 10 to the 10. So this is, a 10, uh, this is a part in 10 to the 8. And we want to do a part in 10 to the 14. That means we have to find where the center of that frequency distribution is to a part in a million of its width. That's not easy, but these people are wonderful. And they can do it to a part in a million, but not much better. And the Doppler shift. Well, you all know about the Doppler shift, right? Uh, I think one of the easiest uh, examples of the Doppler shift is imagine you are on the shore of the, uh, the sea or, or a lake and waves are coming in and hitting the, the beach, you could time what the frequency of those waves hitting the beach is. If you get into a boat and go into the, the surf, they will hit your boat at a higher frequency. If you turn around and come back, they'll hit at a lower frequency. So when, you, when you're moving toward a source of waves, the frequency goes up, and when you're moving away, the frequency goes down. This is how we know that the universe is expanding. Because when we look at distant stars, we see that the frequency of the light from those stars is lower than the frequency from the same kinds of sources on the Earth. And we know that those stars are moving away from us. Well, it's, it works the same way with the atoms. If the atoms are moving relative to the microwaves, it makes it look like the microwaves have a different frequency. And that limits the, the, um, uh, the precision. It's a horrible effect, but there are all kinds of tricks to get rid of it, but not perfectly. And so at the level of a part in 10 to the 14, we have a problem. And another thing is Einstein. Einstein taught us that time is relative. Moving clocks run slow. Our atoms are like moving clocks. This is an effect that's on the order of a part in 10 to the 12. But we want to do a part in 10 to the 14. And there are no tricks to get rid of it. You have to measure the velocity of the atoms and correct for it. And that's not easy to do. And that limits the performance to a part in 10 to the 14. And we are the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We are not satisfied with a part in 10 to the 14. We want to do better. And if we're going to do better, the only way that we can do better is to uh, uh, well, that just says the same thing that I've already said. The only thing that we can do to make it better is to make the atoms move more slowly. And making the atoms move more slowly means cooling them down. Because the difference between hot and cold is the difference between fast and slow. If we have a hot gas, like the air in this room, in fact, it's feeling kind of hot to me, so I think, now let's see. Unfortunately, somehow I'm caught up on my... Uh, uh, the cord from my microphone. Let's hope that I can extricate myself from that. May I ask a question? Sure.
sure. Um, yes and no. So the main accuracy comes from the time between the preparation and the time when you make the measurement. It's during the time that the microwaves are on. We do the detection afterwards. So if you, if you were doing the detection while the microwaves were on, then that would have an effect. Now there's a more subtle effect that has to do with the fact that uh, your microwave standard itself is moving around. And the fact that you aren't always looking at the atoms causes a, uh, an extra uncertainty. It doesn't actually cause a, uh, uh, an error, but it causes an additional uncertainty because of the fact that your microwave source is drifting around. And there are a number of, of tricks to get rid of that problem as well. But, but yes, there are a lot of subtle things like that that affect things. That's exactly right. OK. So. Uh, as I said, the difference between hot and cold is the difference between fast and slow. Or more precisely, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of the atoms in the gas of which you're trying to measure the temperature. It's true of solids as well. If we look at the vibration of, uh, of uh, atoms uh, in a solid, it's uh, proportional to the, the temperature. That is the energy of that. So what we need to do is to cool our gas. If we were able to cool the air in this room, it would mean that the, um, the molecules uh, and atoms in the air in this room were moving more slowly. Uh, so in order to uh, give you some idea about how cold we want to make these things, I've brought along, courtesy of friends at the university, some really, really cold stuff. This, what I have, in a number of these containers here is liquid nitrogen. So this container is full of liquid nitrogen. Now liquid nitrogen, remember the major constituent of the air is nitrogen. So this is effectively like liquid air. When I pour it out here, it boils immediately and it's really exciting for the people in the front row. <laughs> And only a little bit more dangerous. Oh, and there's wonderful things going on. I wish I had time to explain the Leidenfrost effect to you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is so cold that compared to it, this surface, the floor, everything in this room is burning hot. And if you've got something this cold, if you haven't been in a low temperature physics laboratory, the chances are this is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. So if you've got something this cold, it seems quite reasonable to use it to cool down a gas. So now uh, uh, what I've got here is a bucket of, of liquid nitrogen. Let me just uh, refill it a little bit because, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, because it's, it's boiled off a little bit. So let me, let me refill that a little bit. And now what I've got here is a traditional container for hot gas. And what I'm going to do is to take this balloon full of hot air. And uh, remember, I'm from near Washington, DC. So hot air is a... Uh, <laughs> is a staple of our existence. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to put it into the liquid nitrogen to cool it down so as to make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And that way, uh, if they're moving more slowly, then we should be able to make a, a better job of measuring them and be able to make better atomic clocks. OK, so let's let that cool down. And let's see what else we can do now. OK. So here is uh, another Dewar flask. Uh, it's basically a thermos bottle. It's been sitting out at room temperature all day. That means that compared to the liquid nitrogen, this thing is burning hot. So what would happen if you took a, a bucket, a metal bucket, and heated it up in a fireplace until it was glowing red and then poured cold water into it? Well, what would happen is it would boil over. 
And that's what's happening here. Okay, don't try this at home. <laughs> so, um, uh, let's see, what else can I do to show you what's going on? Okay, yes. So, uh, here I have a nice stretchy rubber band, okay? Now what I'm going to do is take the rubber band and dip it into the liquid nitrogen. I've got liquid nitrogen in here, so I'm going to dip it in here. Now I don't think you can see what's going on, but what's happening is that it's making the liquid nitrogen boil because the rubber band is so hot. But it doesn't take very long before the, uh, the rubber band is cooled down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen, so the boiling stops. And when I take it out, this thing is frozen so hard that it snaps as if it were a dry twig. Now, all I have to do is to warm it up in my hands, and it's a nice stretchy rubber band again. This stuff is really, really cold. And, you know, if you've got something that's, uh, that's that cold, then it makes perfect sense to, uh, to use it to cool down your gas. So, let's cool down some more gas uh, to make the atoms and molecules move, uh, move more slowly so that we can, uh, we can study them better, because that's the whole point. If they move more slowly, we can make a better job of measuring them. So let's just stuff this in here. And, uh, and, and get the, the atoms and molecules to move more slowly. Okay, great. Now, I look in here and I can see that the, uh, uh, a lot of liquid nitrogen has boiled off. So let's just top it up a little bit. Now, I've got these nice fresh flowers. So here's a flower that has been uh, sitting out at room temperature all day. It's a nice fresh flower. Uh, uh, so imagine, uh, but, but compared to the liquid nitrogen, this, uh, uh, this flower is red hot. In fact, as you can see, it's even red. And um, uh, so imagine what would happen if you took a fireplace poker and uh, a metal rod and heated it up in the fire until it was glowing red and then took it out and plunged it into a bucket of cold water. What would happen? It would make the water boil. And that's what's going on here. So let's let that boil away while uh, 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 cooling down and let's cool down some more gas. <laughs> what? <laughs> Because, you know, if we're going to do experiments with cold gas, we want to make sure that we've got lots of, uh, lots of sample. So let's, uh, let's, let's get, this, uh, get this so that it's nice and cold. And we've got lots of, lots of gas, okay? Yeah, okay. Sometimes I worry that I blow them up too big so they won't fit, but this one's going in just nicely. Okay, fine. Now, uh, let's see what else can I do. I'm sure that when you were young and you were learning uh, from your parents how to do things in the kitchen, that you were warned that you should never ever take a closed container of liquid and put it into the oven. <laughs> well, here we have <laughs> a container. Here we have some liquid. So now we're going to pour the liquid into the container. very carefully. That's a good amount. And now what I'm going to do is to put the lid on really tight. And now compared to the liquid nitrogen, this room and everything in it is like an oven. Okay, <laughs> now let's come back to the flower. <laughs> so I look in here and I see that the boiling has subsided. 
That means that the flour is now cooled down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. When I take it out, the flour is frozen so hard that I can break it like it was made out of glass. This stuff is really, really cold. And I see that I've got a lot of detritus here, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, we'll... Okay, now, so, this stuff is incredibly cold, and it's pretty clear that if you've got something that cold, <laughs> then it makes perfect sense to, uh, to use it to uh, 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 cool down your gas to make the atoms and molecules more, move more slowly, which is what we've been doing with these, uh, with these balloons trying to, uh, to get the atoms and molecules to move more slowly so that we can uh, do a better job of, uh, uh, of, uh, of measuring them. Okay, so now uh, I just want to show you one more thing. Uh, here is a nice, a nice bouncy rubber ball. Okay, nice, nice bouncy rubber ball. Let's put this rubber ball into the liquid nitrogen to see how... Uh, how things go. Where, where is, the, is the thing that I wanted to use? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Let's, let's just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm forgetting what I'm doing here. <laughs> so, so we'll just, uh, okay, fine. Let's, let's let that, that, that cool down. Now let's talk a little bit about how cold this stuff is. I've said that unless you've been in a low temperature physics laboratory, it's probably the coldest stuff you've ever seen. To understand how cold it is, we need to think about the temperature scale that physicists like to use. So, you know, environmentally, we talk about uh, how cold it is in degrees Celsius. So, uh, I don't know how cold it gets here in Heidelberg in the winter, but it probably gets below zero Celsius on a cold day, right? Physicists don't like this below zero stuff. Uh, so we want to keep all the temperatures positive. So we have a temperature scale called the Kelvin scale, the absolute temperature scale, where the lowest possible temperature is called zero. We call that absolute zero. Now, why is there a lowest possible temperature scale? Well, uh, because uh, what is temperature? It's about motion, right? And what's the slowest you can go? Well, the slowest you can go is stopped. And so there's a lowest possible temperature. And roughly speaking, uh, absolute zero is when the motion stops. Now, it's not really true, as it turns out. Because of quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, even at absolute zero, the motion doesn't really stop. But let's just say among us friends that absolute zero is when the motion stops. And so measuring up from absolute zero room temperature, where we are right now, is about 300 Kelvin, 300 degrees uh, above absolute zero. Ice melts at about 273. The coldest temperature that was ever measured anywhere on the face of the Earth is about 185 degrees above absolute zero. 10 degrees colder than dry ice. 185 degrees above absolute zero. My friends, this stuff that is so cold that when I pour it out uh, here, it just boils and excites the people in the front row. This stuff is 77 degrees above absolute zero. 77 degrees above absolute zero. The, the coldest stuff you've ever seen. Let me uh, see what's happened to our, our racquetball. Is this... Uh... Anyway, let's just see how it bounces now. It breaks like it was made out of porcelain. This stuff is really, really cold. And <laughs> Your mother was right. <laughs> you should never put a closed container of liquid in the oven. Um, now, also, I should say that that. Um, uh, you know, you see me doing all this stuff with liquid nitrogen, um, and, and you think, oh, that would be cool to do that. Yes, it is. But 
it's also something that those of us who are doing this have been safety trained in the use of liquid nitrogen. So it's not something you should just do casually. If you want to play with liquid nitrogen, I really encourage that. Uh, but you do need to, uh, to have the right safety training and do the right things. Now, uh, okay, so the point was that this stuff is really, really cold and we would want to use it to cool down uh, a gas. But I think that a number of you have noticed that the volume of the balloons that I put into this liquid nitrogen in order to cool down the gas, the volume of the balloons rather exceeded the volume of the bucket by a good bit. And the reason is that these balloons have essentially turned into Frisbees. These things are as flat as pancakes. So does anybody remember how many balloons I put in? Four, Four right. And they were red and, and purple, right? Uh, what, about, what about yellow? How about white? Uh, what about another yellow? What about another white one? How about an orange one? How about another orange one? So, you see, I put a whole bunch of balloons in before we started, and they're all flat. Uh, okay, let's go back to the, we're on the, there, okay. So here is what goes on. If you take any, <laughs> if you take any uh, container of gas and put it in contact with something cold, this is standard refrigeration, uh, then if it's cold enough, uh, then the gas will condense into a liquid or a solid, or it will stick to the walls of the container, and you will not have a gas anymore. Now, the ticking frequency that we want to get from the cesium atom is for cesium atoms that are isolated, uh, floating freely in a vacuum. If they're stuck onto other cesium atoms or stuck onto a container, they are not going to give us that perfect ticking frequency. So this is not going to work. This is not the way that we can cool down atoms in order to, uh, uh, to get them to move more slowly. We have to find a way of cooling the atoms without touching them, because it's the touching them with something else that's cold that makes them condense. And the answer for how we're going to do that has been staring at us from the heavens for centuries, because since the time of Kepler, people have known that the tails of comets always point away from the sun. So when the sun comes in from the Oort cloud, I mean, when the uh, comet comes in from the Oort cloud and the sun warms up the dust and gas that make up the comet, it pushes on that dust to make the tail. And so the tail streams behind the comet, but when the comet comes around and goes back out, the tail streams in front of the comet. And Kepler knew this, and he guessed correctly that the sunlight was pushing on the comet tail. We're going to do the same thing using light from a laser to push on our atoms to make them slow down. And this is what we call laser cooling. Now, the idea of laser cooling is totally crazy. Because we all know that if you shine light on something, it should get hot. And I'm claiming to you that we can shine light on something and it will get cold. <laughs> how does that work? Well, in order to understand how it works, you have to understand two things. One is the idea of resonance. Uh, and the idea here is, if I've got a gas of atoms or a gas of molecules, like the air in this room, and I shine light through it, the light goes right through. It's transparent. That's why we can see one another, right? That's why this laser beam makes it to the, uh, to the screen. Because the frequency of this light doesn't match any of the frequencies that the atoms and molecules in the air like to absorb at. But if I send in just the right color, so for example, let's say that I had a gas of sodium atoms, like you see in these yellow street lamps, and you shine just the right color of yellow light into it, then those sodium atoms will absorb that light and they will feel a force from, because the, the light will transmit force onto the atom. It'll push on the atoms. And if we can make the atoms absorb in such a way that the, the, the light is pointing against the way the atoms are moving, then it'll make them slow down. Well, how do we do that? Well, it's the Doppler shift, which you've already talked about. When we move toward a source of light, it looks like the frequency is higher. And when we move away, it looks like the frequency is lower. So let's take a one-dimensional 
uh, simplification of atoms in a gas. Some are moving to the left, some are moving to the right. And here we have a laser beam pointing toward the atoms that is tuned a little bit below the frequency that the atoms like to absorb. But this atom that's moving toward the laser beam sees it Doppler shifted up in frequency, so it's closer to its resonant frequency. It absorbs the light and slows down. This atom, on the other hand, moving this way, looks and sees that the frequency is lower, and it was already too low, so it does not absorb the light very much. If it did, you see it would speed up, but it doesn't absorb very much. So now, you bring in light from the other side, and, uh, and now this atom goes this way and absorbs light from this laser beam and slows down. This atom goes this way and absorbs light from this laser beam and slows down. So no matter which way the atom goes, it picks out the laser beam that is opposing its motion and absorbs from it. And it works just fine if you do it in, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, you bring in laser beams from top and bottom and backwards and forwards. And no matter which way the atom goes, it sees those laser beams that are opposing its motion being the ones that are absorbed. Uh, it is as if the atoms are in a viscous fluid. Let's hold the question until the end. But remember that question, OK? Because <laughs> I'm getting a little bit worried about how this time is going. But I will answer all questions. Um, uh, it, the atoms are like they're in a viscous fluid. If you were in a swimming pool full of molasses and tried to move, you would find that uh, no matter which way you moved, that there was a force opposing your motion. The atoms feel the same way. And when Steve Chu and his colleagues at Bell Labs in 1985 did this, they called it optical molasses. And the name sort of stuck. Uh, you may recognize the name Steve Chu because he was the Secretary of Energy in the first uh, Obama administration, the first uh, Nobel laureate uh, ever to be appointed to a cabinet post. Uh, here is a picture of that optical molasses with laser beams coming from all directions. This is a cloud of sodium atoms about uh, a centimeter across with about 100 million atoms. And the question is, how cold are they? I haven't told you about how we calculate the temperature, but it's an easy calculation. And you can calculate that the temperature should be as cold as 240 micro Kelvin, 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. That is 300,000 times colder than liquid nitrogen, which boils when I pour it out onto the, uh, the ground, which is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. 300,000 times colder than that. And so people got really excited about that. And here's a picture from our laboratory from around that time. But how do you measure the temperature of something like that? And the answer is you measure how fast the atoms are going. So you start with the atoms in the optical molasses. They're jiggling around. They don't go very far because the laser beam stops them if they start going in any uh, given direction. But then you turn the laser beams off, and now the atoms just expand freely. You measure, you turn the laser beams on a little bit later, and uh, the ratio of the number of atoms you start with to the number of atoms you end up with tells you what the temperature is. Well, they did that at Bell Labs, and they found that the temperature was 240 microkelvin, the coldest temperature allowed by the theory. We repeated those measurements and found exactly the same thing. And other people made other measurements with different atoms where you could predict a different temperature, and it was all consistent. Until we started to do some more experiments that weren't quite making sense. And when we started to probe more deeply, we found out, much to our surprise, that the temperatures were much colder than the theory had predicted. Now, this is clearly a violation of Murphy's Law, because we were trying to make the coldest temperatures we could, and we apparently made temperatures colder than we could. Uh, in fact, we felt a lot like the uh, poor devils uh, in this cartoon who have seen the proverbial snowball in hell, uh, uh, something much colder than it had any uh, right to be. And so uh, other people confirmed the experiments, and it was clear we needed a new theory. And there were heated discussions about the nature of that theory. And eventually, a new theory emerged. Claude Cohen-Tanuji, who shared the 1997 Nobel Prize for laser cooling, and his young colleague, Jean Dalibar, figured out what was going on. 
And once we knew what was happening, we could adjust our experiments to make them even better. And by 1995, we had cooled cesium atoms to 700 nanokelvin. 700 nanokelvin, that's 200 times colder than the theory had originally said was possible. That is 100 million times colder than liquid nitrogen, which is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. It's 4 million times colder than the cosmic microwave background, which fills all of space, which you might say is the coldest natural temperature in the universe. So when I say this is the coolest stuff in the universe, I really mean it. It's 4 million times colder than the microwave background radiation. The velocity of these atoms is only one centimeter per second compared to a few hundred meters per second. And so people have been able to make atomic clocks in which they take the atoms and they throw them up in the air. Well, not in the air, it's in a vacuum. And they throw them up about a meter and they come back down after about a second. So instead of having one one hundredth of a second, 10 milliseconds, they get a full second. And these atomic fountain clocks are the best clocks that, uh, that have ever been. These are the best primary standards. We call them fountains because it's sort of like a water jet going up. And these things are now good to a part in 10 to the 16, one second in three million years. But you might ask, what are we going to do if we want to keep these atoms in a container? How are you going to keep the coldest stuff in the universe in a container? Because if you put it in a hot container, it's just going to heat it up. And if you put it in a cold container, it's going to stick to it. So the only way that you can do it is to not use a container that has any material walls at all. So let's switch to the camera that's looking at this apparatus. And the way we do it is, uh, OK, what's going on? Yeah, OK, right. So what we have here is a big magnet. And what we have here is a little magnet. Now, it turns out that our atoms are just like little magnets. And it's been arranged so that this big magnet will push up on the little magnet. And so it should push up in such ways to make this, this little magnet float right here. If you ever tried this when you were a kid and you had a bunch of magnets and you laid them out on a table and you tried to make other magnet, another magnet float above it, just that's what I'm doing here. And if you ever tried that, it never worked because what happens is the little magnet flips over and gets attracted to the big magnet. But you learned something else when you were a child and that is that if you spin a top, that it won't fall over. But our atoms are actually little tiny spinning magnets and so when we spin it, we can keep it from flipping over, and this thing will float. <laughs> right. So that's how, that's, how, that's how we trap our atoms. And uh, that was the toy version. Here is the real thing. Um, there. <laughs> These are a cloud of cesium atoms that are put into a magnetic trap and uh, they're bouncing back and forth because they were put in a little bit off center and you'll notice that as time goes on these atoms go away because the vacuum isn't perfect. Well, holding atoms in magnetic traps or in other kinds of traps like laser traps and electric and magnetic traps for ions we can hold atoms for many seconds. And, and in this way, we can make atomic clocks that are even better. Here's a picture of Jun Yi in his laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, holding atoms in a laser trap. He has made a, a, a clock using an optical transition, so not oscillating at uh, 10 to the 10th hertz, but oscillating close to 10 to the 15 hertz, uh, making a clock that is good to two parts in 10 to the 18. But that's just beginning. Dave Weiland, also in our uh, laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, who got a Nobel Prize for something else, uh, has now made aluminum ions in an ion trap operating as a clock at 9 times 10 to the 19. This is less than one second in the age of the universe. At the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency of the US government, this is what we call close enough for government work. <laughs> so, so we come to the end. We come to the end 
Uh, and we've been on a kind of an odyssey to get colder and colder temperatures, as illustrated by this logarithmic thermometer. Each uh, tick mark is a factor of 10 in temperature. And at the top, we have the surface of the sun. Not the hottest thing there is, but pretty hot. But you'll notice that room temperature is only slightly cooler than the surface of the sun, and even liquid nitrogen is only slightly cooler than that. In fact, on this scale, outer space, the coldest natural temperature in the universe is only a little bit colder than the surface of the sun. Our first experiments with laser cooling were colder compared to outer space than outer space is compared to the surface of the sun. And since then, we've been getting colder and colder. And I don't have time to tell you about other cooling techniques and Bose-Einstein condensation that have gotten us colder compared to the first laser cooling measurements than those were compared to the surface of the sun. Uh, and now we are at less than one nanokelvin, less than one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And maybe in the future, these cold atoms will go into space. We now have a cold atom experiment on the International Space Station, and we're hoping to get temperatures that go below one picokelvin. All kinds of wonderful things have come from this. Better clocks, all of the clocks in the industrialized world now rely on laser-cooled atoms. So at PTB, at uh, NPL in uh, the UK, uh, at NBS, at the National Metrology Laboratories in China and Japan, they're all using laser-cooled atoms uh, to, to keep time for the country and for the world. These things are being used for tests of some of the most fundamental theories of nature, and they're being used for quantum computing. So I wish I had time to talk about quantum computing and why and how cold atoms are being used, but, uh, but we have to come to the end. And so I want to acknowledge the wonderful group that I work with, and I want to point out this picture was taken a few years ago, and back here we have uh, Fred, and <coughs> Fred stand up. He's one, he was a former postdoc in our group, now at the, uh, at the University of Heidelberg. And, and, and his, his student, Lilo, were, were the ones who made all of this work, all of these wonderful demonstrations. And, and, and here's Trey Porto and Ian Spielman, Gretchen Campbell and Paul Wett are the, the permanent members of the group uh, with whom I'm privileged to work every day. And so I want to remind you, ask me, I will answer. We come to the end, but it's not really the end because there's always something new to learn. Thanks very much. So I, I know I've exceeded my time, uh, but, but, but if we took some questions, the only thing we'd be missing is the coffee break. And what's coffee compared to science? <laughs> so, so ask me a question. Come down later, and I'll give you your prize. Uh, but, uh, but ask me a question. There was one back there. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, when you shine two lasers uh, in opposite directions, they cancel out in some places, and they reinforce in others. This is what we call a standing wave. And in fact, we use that feature to make um, uh, a simulation of a solid with our atomic gases. So by putting the lasers together, we can make a kind of lattice in space, and the atoms get trapped on the lattice sites just in the same way that atoms arrange themselves into a crystal in a solid. And so we use that very fact that the laser cancels in some places and reinforces in others in order to make a model of a solid and to study uh, phenomena in, in solid state physics. Yes? Never, because it's, we're never satisfied. So why not? Because there are all kinds of both scientific and practical reasons why you want better clocks. A scientific reason is that using clocks of this quality, we can ask ourselves, do the constants of nature change? Now, yesterday we heard about a calculation of the fine structure constant. Well, you may believe it or not, but People have been measuring the fine structure constant for a long time, 
And one of the questions is, does it change with time? There is some evidence that back in like astronomical time, uh, less than a billion years after the Big Bang, maybe the fine structure constant was different. But we can measure in the laboratory whether the fine structure constant is changing by looking at two different kinds of clocks of this amazing uh, quality. So that tests one of the most fundamental things about the way we understand physics, whether the constants of nature are in fact constant. Other things like um, uh, high-speed synchronous communication, uh, long baseline interferometry, use uh, very precise uh, atomic clocks. So uh, in the atomic clock business, we say it's like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Uh, when we make better clocks, people find uh, uses for them. Uh, let's have young people. <laughs> uh, you look sort of young, but you're younger than he is. <laughs> you teased it. I know there's not that much time, but what can you tell us about quantum computing? Yeah. All the cold outings. Okay, so quantum computing, very briefly, is that instead of using bits that can be either zero or one, we use what we call quantum bits that can be in a quantum mechanical superposition of zero and one at the same time. That means in a certain sense, they are both zero and one. And the only way we can have that feature is to use quantum mechanical objects like atoms. And the only way we can preserve the information in those atoms is to have them be isolated from their environment and trapping them, for example, in these traps that I demonstrated here is a way of isolating them from the environment and they have to be in a pure quantum state. And that means they have to be incredibly cold. Because if something is hot, it's not in a pure quantum state. And so laser-cooled atoms and ions are one of the ways in which we can realize quantum information. And Reiner Blot over here is one of the most advanced laboratories in the world for using uh, trapped ions as qubits to make uh, quantum computers. So ask him about what the latest things are about, uh, about realizing quantum information using, uh, using laser-cooled ions. But people also do it with superconducting circuits, and people are trying to do it with things like ions embedded in solids. Uh, so there's a lot of different platforms for making quantum information, but my tastes are that the atoms and the ions are the best thing because nature gives them to us perfect. And then it's up to us to mess them up. Whereas the other things, we manufacture them, so they're messed up to begin with. <laughs> so, yes, back there. Yes. So my question is, uh, from the explanation which you gave, it appeared that this ion, that the traps that you create using the laser beam are kind of acting like a filter which just catches the atoms or which are at that particular energy, which is like actually that cold. Yeah, actually it's better than that. We, we don't only catch the things that are a specific energy, we make the things be the right energy. <laughs> so if all we did was filter, we wouldn't really call that cooling. So in fact, we compress the velocity distribution. We don't just, wow, <laughs> I didn't expect that. But remember, I told you to, there would be unexpected loud noises. <laughs> uh, so so, um, so we, we, we take a wide range of velocities and make them uh, go to the, uh, the lowest energy state. Now, I didn't tell you all the tricks that we use to make that happen, but it's not just filtering. Okay, so is that a, like a sorcery of adjusting the energy of the laser beams? Absolutely. You have to make the laser beams uh, be just a little bit lower than the resonant frequency. And in fact, during the cooling process, we often change that frequency a little bit so as to optimize the initial capturing process, and then finally the, uh, the final cooling process, we adjust the, the laser frequency by typically uh, a few megahertz or a few tens of megahertz out of a few times 10 to the 14 hertz. And that might sound like extremely fine control, and it is, but it's easy. Uh, the, the techniques for adjusting laser frequencies at that level are well uh, established and uh, you can actually buy the things that allow you to do that. Yes. Uh, okay, all the way in the back. I was just wondering, with the, with the increased accuracy of these plots, um, do you think that the way that they might be used to measure gravitation? Ah, absolutely. So, here's a funny thing that some of you may already know. 
One of the things that Einstein taught us with his general theory of relativity in 1915 is that clocks that are lower in a gravitational potential will run slower than clocks that are higher in a gravitational potential. The effect is a part in 10 to the 16 per meter on the face of the Earth. So when I first went to NIST in 1978, clocks were good to a part in 10 to the 13. That meant that you could just barely see the difference between Boulder, which is about 1,500 meters high, and sea level, if you had had a clock at sea level, which we did not. So in other words, we couldn't tell. Today, the distance that you can see with the best of these clocks is one centimeter. That's how much things have improved, in part because of laser cooling. Now, what that means is, that because the atoms are affected by the gravitational potential, if the gravitational potential changes as a gravity wave comes by, then you might be able to see that. We're not there yet. We need to improve by another few orders of magnitude, but Junyi tells me, no problem. We're gonna have that done before he dies, maybe not before I die, but, <laughs> but, but yes, so people are thinking about using these clocks uh, for gravity wave detectors, but we're not there yet. But, but people are using them to map gravity. Uh, see, this is an amazing thing. In Boulder, uh, Colorado, there's lots of mountains, and we don't know what the gravitational potential of the mountains is. And so we can't even correct the ticking frequency from boulder down to sea level because we don't know the difference in the gravitational potential. But we will. <laughs> yes? There's an article in the current Scientific American that says that dark matter does not seem to explain satisfactorily the gravitational anomalies that are observed in most of the stars far from the centers of galaxies. But would it be possible then uh, to check on the suggestion in this article that Einstein's general theory should be modified by running one of these very accurate clocks out to the, perhaps uh, distant parts of the solar system. Okay, so the question is, uh, there seems to be a problem with dark matter that some observations about galaxies don't fit with the, the dark matter hypothesis. That was how we first came up with the hypothesis of dark matter, that it didn't fit with the, the, the usual gravitational uh, 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 calculations. But then there's some, some galaxies where the dark matter doesn't seem to fit. And so the question is, what do we know? And the answer is nothing. We don't know anything about dark matter. But could these clocks help us? And maybe, I don't know. Uh, I mean, sending a clock to another galaxy is a really hard thing. On the other hand, uh, it could be that learning something about uh, whether dark matter uh, accumulates around regular matter, which is one of the hypotheses, we might learn something about that with better clocks. But the fact is that the core of what you asked, which was, is Einstein's theory of gravity right? Should we modify it? That's exactly the kind of thing that we want to study with these clocks. So if Einstein is right, if we have two different atomic clocks side by side, and we move them up and down in a gravitational potential, they should change in exactly the same way. If they don't, there's something wrong with the very core of general relativity, which is the equivalence principle. And most people think that in order to make gravity the theory of gravity consistent with the theory of quantum mechanics, we're going to have to give up something. And the thing we're probably going to have to give up is the equivalence principle, which is so near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, and so this, exactly. But something's got to give, because unless we believe that gravity is not quantum mechanical, and that's heretical as well, to, to believe that there's a force in nature that isn't properly described by quantum mechanics, so something has to give. This is an exciting time to be alive uh, because things are bound to change in ways that I don't think anyone can imagine. And we're hoping that these atomic clocks will give us a clue about how that is going to happen. Maybe we should leave it there. And, and everyone who asked a question, come down and get a prize from me. And, and then anybody else wants to ask questions, 
ask me. <laughs> Thank you.